So uh, I appreciate very much the invitation uh, and to, to exchange ideas about Alzheimer's disease with such a uh, high, outstanding uh, panel of people. Um, I'm also very happy that uh, the Paul Allen Foundation uh, understands that Alzheimer's disease is a major threat for our health, for the, the world health, and uh, I'm very happy that they watch at it and, and bring their attention to this problem, and I hope that they are as successful with that problem as with the other problems we just heard about. Um, so, I'm, so um, I'm going to talk about Alzheimer's disease, but before I go into the science, I would like to get, give you an idea about the, the, the threat, the, the importance of this problem. And what you hear, see here in this slide is the number of Alzheimer's people we have at the moment in the world, demented people in the world, which is about 50 million. But if you look for the next 35 years, you see the rapid increase in the number of these people. It's a kind of epidemic. Um, and uh, in 2050, we expect to have 135 million patients over the world. And the important point here is that, in contrast to what many people think, it's not only the, the rich countries, the, the, uh, the USA, Europe, or, or other rich countries, but the main growth will be in South America, in Africa, and in the middle-income countries in Asia, India, and so on. And so it's really a worldwide issue. So the major cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. That's why it's sometimes used in both directions. But dementia is a symptom. Alzheimer is a disease. And the disease was defined by Alois Alzheimer. Many of you know that. Uh, he wrote about his disease in 1907 and described for the first time the amyloid plaques and the neuronal tangles, which are still the definition of the disease. For me, the challenging, or in fact, the tantalizing question here is, since we know this disease since 1907, why didn't we make more progress at this moment? And uh, I think there are two reasons for it. For, well, there are many reasons for it, but two main reasons. First of all, of course, brain and brain studying brain and how it works is, is, is not easy, and getting medication in the brain is not easy. But there's a more fundamental reason here, and that's that Alzheimer's disease has always been, uh, and dementia has always been, uh, considered in, an, in a fatalistic way, it's something which is associated with age, which is unavoidable, and where research is, well, yeah, it's okay, but, but it's not the most exciting place to be. And this has resulted really in a huge knowledge gap. I'm going to try to illustrate that in the next slide. So if you go to PubMed, you find 250,000 publications on AIDS, which started in the 80s, and you find only 130,000 on Alzheimer's, so it's half. And it's even worse if you look to other, other words like dementia or neurodegenerative disorders and you compare that then with cancer, diabetes or heart disease. So remember that the number of people affected by Alzheimer's disease is in the same order of magnitude of these other diseases, but you have a 20-fold more bigger knowledge ba bank when you start to study cancer than when you start to study neurodegenerative disorders. So there's really a big gap to be filled. So, but the times are changing, and that's the good news. And they are changing at several levels. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about politics, but the WHO has finally accepted that dementia is a major threat. And uh, the previous uh, director general, uh, I, I put here some quotes from her side, but basically, in essence, she says, it's the responsibility of the politicians to do something about it. The industry should be, uh, should be engaged and invest more, and if they don't, we should take our responsibility. And then she basically said to the politicians, we count on you to get this, uh, this disease uh, uh, solved. Honestly, I think my hope is more with the science, um, uh, and there also the times are changing. So if you look to, to the, the previous period, the previous century, we circled around these amyloid plaques and around uh, these tangles, and, of course, we raised the question once in a while, is there something else? But basically, we didn't have really the tools to go into that problem. And if you think about what happened over the last 10 years, 10, 15 years, we got really a tremendous breakthrough in all kinds of techniques um, uh, in, neuro, in neurosciences. And I will just point out three here, which I think, which I'm using actually, and which have changed the way I'm thinking about, about the disease and which I would like to build up uh, uh, in a broader uh, engagement. So the first is single cell biology. Um, and you know that uh, researchers work what are trying to make this uh, human cell atlas. I think we should use these approaches to understand what's going on in the brain of patients. And I will, I will show you in a minute how. Then the second thing is the models we were using, the transgenic models, were not the best. 
And um, to be fair, only certain aspects of the disorder, mainly the biochemical aspects, could be mimicked. So we need better models here. And uh, I believe very strongly in humanized models. Not, 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 not uh, the, one, uh, the two dimensional cultures of iPS cells, but really three dimensional cultures, models in, 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 in vitro. And also, as I will show you, um, uh, chimeric MOMS models, which allow you to access certain questions which you couldn't do before. The third thing is noble technology. Um, and I cite here three papers uh, from my field where CryoM has been used to finally understand this vague concept of, of abnormal structure, pathological structure. And so these papers are really changing the way we are thinking, and we will see much more of that in the next, uh, next decade. And then finally, um, I'm not going to talk about novel treatments, but I think that we have never been as close for treatments for this type of disorders as now. And the reason is not that there is a major, a major breakthrough in, in the field of neurodegeneration, but there is a major be, be, um, breakthrough in spinal muscular atrophy treatment. It's a very rare disorder, but you can treat it with oligonucleotides, and the, ex, the, the results are spectacular. And basically, the same principle could be very useful for, um, for treating uh, the neurodegenerative disorders with upregulating of certain proteins, etc., etc. We can discuss this later if you want. But in the new institute I'm going to head, we will have a specific, um, a, a specific unit to test these antisense therapies in the different forms of uh, neurodegeneration. There is actually a trial running for uh, Huntington disease, and there is also first experiments in people with uh, tau mutation, frontotemporal dementia, using these antisense uh, therapies. So I think the landscape has really changed, and I will illustrate that by uh, using curves which the clinicians use to describe Alzheimer's disease. And I think these curves are really misleading, but uh, you will see how I move from there to, to what I think is the current reality of the situation. So they are probably the most shown pictures at Alzheimer meetings, and it's basically a reformulation of the amyloid hypothesis. So what you see here is a cross-sectional uh, it's, it's not really a study because it's, it's based, it's an extrapolation on, on, on information available, but uh, it's a cross-sectional uh, representation of what happens in, in patients, as we think, so, as, as they think. So you get first an accumulation of amyloid, then an accumulation of tau, changes in brain structure, memory, and clinical uh, dysfunction. And so the thing is wrong, first of all, because it suggests a very linear relationship between accumulation of amyloid and all these other things. And nothing, nothing is there which, in contrast, there are arguments against that, that if you lower this curve, that you will lower all these other curves. And second, and this is the positive news of this, it shows something very, very important, which has changed my way of thinking about Alzheimer's disease, and that this, this blue arrow, and this blue arrow indicates a very long gap between the amyloid and the first real structure changes in the brain. This gap is 20 to 30 years. So this on its own already tells you that this is not a simple disease and a simple linear relationship. And this has made me starting to think about what's going on there. And so the clinicians like to call this, I'm sorry. The clinicians like to call this the prodromal or the non-clinical or the asymptomatic phase of Alzheimer's disease. That's not engaging basic scientists. And so I thought we need another name for this process, and so I called it the cellular phase. It's a phase where the brain reacts on the biochemical phase, on the biochemical changes, a beta accumulation, tau accumulation, with all kinds of to be further studied cellular actions and reactions. I'm going into that in a minute. And then after 20 or 30 years, the homeostasis of the brain is disturbed, and then that's then the moment when you start to see structural and clinical alterations. So what's the, the scientific basis for this? Well, we go back to the genetics. The genetics have really revolu revolutionized our field. Um, um, and, and this graph is a bit difficult, but uh, just give me a minute because it's extremely informative. So what you see here is a graph, a representation of all the genes which have been associated either directly or indirectly to Alzheimer's disease. And what you see on the x-axis, uh, on the y-axis, is your risk to get Alzheimer's disease with one of these forms of genes. And so here on top, of course, you have the, the, the amyloid genes, presenlin 1, presenlin 2, and APP, which, if you have a mutation, give you 100% disease, and which are the real basis for the amyloid hypothesis. But then you have this whole rest of, um, this whole other bunch of genes, 
which it's not very clear what they exactly do. There's a lot of extrapolation. And, uh, uh, but anyhow, so APOE is one of the major, major elephants in the, in the room, um, uh, which uh, incre if you have a carrier, you get about 50% chance to get Alzheimer's disease. So it's really a major risk factor. But then if you go further, you find more common variants of, these ge of genes, uh, of, of, uh, of, of SNPs, which are associated with a moderate increase of your risk, 1.1, 1.2, not more than that, but which cumulative could, of course, also increase seriously uh, your risk for this disorder. And so if you look to what this means, it's, it, bring, it links Alzheimer's disease to phospho and phospholipid, lipid and phospholipid, and also to mainly microglia function, really very crucial. But there are probably also other things. And here again, you see that the field jumped to conclusion because everybody's saying it's microglia, it's microglia. But if you look to the gene table here, um, and you look where these genes are expressed, so without much speculation, the only thing is looking where are these genes, in what cells are they expressed. And I just indicated in yellow genes which are not neuronal. And you see that they are in microglia, but also in endothelial cells, in uh, oligodendrocytes, in astrocytes. So basically, the genetics tell us already that it's not simple a biochemical disorder, it's a multicellular it's a chronic multicellular disorder. And the processes which go wrong, we are going to study in the cellular phase. And so, so I think this is a much more realistic representation of hap what happens during this blue arrow. So you have the contribution of these different cells and different the neurovascular unit and so on. And you have feedback and feed forward loops. And basically, it's very interesting to study this because this is about the homeostasis of the brain. It's about normal cells. It's not in the dying phase of the, of, the, of the brain. And it's going to learn us a lot about how the normal brain is functioning. And moreover, it's probably the phase where we have to act because this is before you have clinical symptoms. So if we can continue that phase or if we can stabilize the, the disease in that, in that moment, we will do really something about this Alzheimer's disease. And so that's why I'm thinking that we need a single cell atlas of Alzheimer's disease. So this allows you to study all these different individual changes at once separately. And I will illustrate my point with some research we did to, to, to provide proof of concept and proof of principle of this. Um, um, and we use a mouse model which was generated in Ricken, which is a knock-in mouse model, and which is basically an amyloidosis model. It's very interesting because it has a knock-in gene, so you don't disturb the, the genetic expression of all kinds of genes by this overexpression. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting because you get amyloid plaques gradually over time. At nine months, the brain is full. And you get really, it's a good model for inflammation because you get a gradual uh, increase in the inflammation in this mouse. And the second interesting thing is that you get the difference between male and female mouse. So it's probably also a fine model to study gender differences. And so what we did is instead of doing the classical smoothie approach, so you have the brain, you grind it, and you start to analyze all the genes. Or basically, if you do even at the cell level, you try always to say the microglia are doing this or are doing that. I'm more interested in the fruit of this, uh, of this smoothie. And so we need to individually look to the different constituents of this smoothie. And so I'm not, I have not the time to go into the details, but the information you can gain from such an approach is incredible. And I will just illustrate, well, the single cell biologists know this scheme, but I, I, th I think it's very illustrative. If you do the smoothie, you see these three genes and they are expressed at the same level and nothing interesting is happening. But if you do it at the individual single level, you see that the blue is never present when the red is there and vice versa. So there is an anti-correlation between this red and this green. And this type of information will escape you completely if you use the smoothie approach. So what we did with these mice is we took uh, a brain material from, from three months, six months, 12 months, and 21 months to follow the increasing amyloidosis and the increasing microgliosis. And we did it for male and female. And of course, we have also the controls for this, so, so mice from the same age without amyloidosis. And we wanted to do all the cells, but since we found out that isolation of brain cells is a very tough thing, and I think that there are overstatements in the literature about that, but the only cells which could really reproducibly isolate were the microglia, and so since it's a proof of concept, we went on with the microglia at this stage. And so here you see 10,000 individual microglia. For each microglia, we have about two to 3,000 genes which we, can, which we know the expression of. 
And uh, this is bioinformatics, and I'm going to invest a lot in bioinformatics. Uh, unfortunately, I have an MD background, so um, I'm lacking a lot of knowledge. But this is what I do with these Disney blots, and you get the first organization of your information. And actually, it's very interesting. Uh, I, I, I come back to that in a minute. But the first observation, oh, yeah, there it is already. OK, the first observation you do here is that all these microglia uh, expression are very similar. They are clustered together. That's the first thing. If you would do neurons and microglia, you would get two, two populations. But second, there is structure in this. And so here, this, this, this end of the, of the spectrum um, is basically, if you look to what mice are represented there, um, then you see that there is an over-representation of the red, and that are the knock-in mice. So these are the amyloid mice. And then the second interesting thing is if you look to the edge, and you see that there is a lot of purple in that. So they are enriched for knock-in mice, which are aged. And so we went on and started to look to genes, and I'm not going into the details, and we're still analyzing it, and we're inventing while we are working on this, how to analyze this data. But it's very cool, it's very exciting actually, if you look to this graph, which came out very early in our study. This gene here, this is, in, this is expression of individual genes, and this is the apo, lipoprotein E gene, which everybody thought is neurons, I, I think everybody, not me, but I thought it was astroglia, but it's really a population of microglia which gets a huge increase, and this is not small changes, this is a tenfold increase, a five to tenfold increase in APOE expression. And then if you look further, there is this TREM2 gene which is associated with Alzheimer's, slightly increased, I, I don't want to make much out of it, but here you have a gene which is downregulated when microglia get activated, and so it's, it's enriched, and so, and this is also a gene which we did know, but which is clearly associated, cystocin 7, which is clearly associated with the activation of, well, we think activation, uh, of this APOE overexpressing astroglia, uh, microglia, sorry. Um, and so these are other genes, but I'm not going to spend too much time on it. So we checked where this APOE overexpressing microglia were. Um, and here you see an in situ hybridization. Um, uh, and this white, these ugly white things here are amyloid plaques, and the blue are nuclei, and the red is, apolipo, uh, is APOE expression. And you see basically that this microglia, we use the green marker for the microglia, are clustered around these amyloid plaques and are overexpressing. So the, this cluster, which we just demonstrated, is located around the plaques. And you see here, for instance, a an, uh, an microglia which is far away. It doesn't express this APOE. So it's really a local effect, a local reaction on these on this plaques. And so we can also look to, to the female cortex only, because the gender, it's an important issue. Um, and I'm not going into the details, but again, we find in this cluster where we only look to the microglia isolated from the female mice, again, such a cluster which has high APOE, and which is, you can look to all the genes at once also, of course, and you see here in this cluster a huge program of downregulated genes in this APOE overexpressing uh, cells in the female cortex. And so we are analyzing this further and further um, to, know, to understand what's going on. So, just to, I, I think this, this already warrants why we need to go further into this. We need to do that for astroglia, we need to do that for neurons, we need to have good mechanisms to analyze co-expression, etc. Uh, there are luckily a lot of these tools. And so, um, I, well, we get, we get a gene, uh, gene signature. We, well, I'm going to, to go a bit quicker through this because I think that uh, perspectives are much more important. So if you think about this, you could start to think about can we manipulate this microglia? And you can do screens, basically, because you have a profile of this APOE overexpressing uh, uh, microglia, and you could consider a screen where you try to find drugs which reverse this phenotype to the normal phenotype, to ask the question, is this a cause? Is this a part of the, of the toxicity of the brain or not? So that's the first thing. The second is the yeah, effect of gender I, I stressed already. I think also it raises questions about an, a very much used approach, clinical approach in the field where we use immunization. But immunization means that you bind antibodies against these plaques and maybe you can remove them. But the microglia have FC receptors and maybe you activate and drive them into this overactivated stage. And so nobody knows what that means. So that's maybe part of the explanation why this uh, approach has not worked very well. And then I think we need to go into the full human brain. This is mouse, but we need to go in the full human brain. 
uh, we will probably use nuclear uh, isolation because of the difficulty to isolate cells from, uh, from, uh, from uh, adult brain. Um, and we need also spatial resolution, uh, as you saw, in situ hybridization, but we have much higher throughput systems now, uh, which we are establishing, and two examples here, but there are others uh, which we can discuss later on. So it's very, very clear if you want to make this cell atlas that it's not my lab alone that will do it, uh, or, or, the, or the other labs which are doing it. This needs an effort which should be combined with the human cell atlas, which is the normal, normal cell atlas, but with a focus on disease, because I think it's the only way to get beyond the descriptions of Alois Alzheimer and to get the real full information. Of course, we also need to, to wait until we have better proteomics because I would like to complement the RNA expression with real protein expression. So, but, okay, we have these brains of patients, but they are frozen brains, they are at the final stage of the disease, and so you can always argue, what does this mean for the initial phases of the disease, which are the more interesting ones? And so we need models, but the mouse models are as good as they are. They don't get tangles, they don't get really cell dead. So can we improve on that? And so that's where I'm coming to my humanized models for Alzheimer's disease. And I will, see, I will t talk a little bit about experiments. We, we, we started in, in collaboration with, with uh, Pierre van der Aagen, a, 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 a person who studied human corticogenesis with his approach. And I thought, if you can use his approach to study neurodegeneration, how cool would that be? And so basically, we start from iPS cells. But instead of culturing them for months in a dish to get mature phenotypes, we thought if we bring them in the three-dimensional, in a real three-dimensional structure, namely the brain, and see how they evolve and grow. And so Pierre had already demonstrated that you get the different, um, the different subtypes of, of the different layers of the cortex. And uh, he had also shown that you can keep the mice for quite a long time, eight months, nine months. Uh, we are using not skit, it's not the best background to suppress, but we can do a lot of experiments. And so we decided to test what happened if you transplant these neurons in a mouse amyloid model to see what happens with human neurons in contrast to mouse neurons. And I'm going to skip this. This is showing that we got different uh, um, uh, excellent transplantation. But you see here, for instance, in this graft, it's a bit in disadvantage. They, they grow as a, as a clump in the, in the brain. Uh, we are working on it to get more, more neurons like, like this. But for these experiments, we use this approach, and you see here amyloid, amyloid appearing in the human transplant, which is coming from the mouse, the mouse which overexpresses a beta. And you see also this hole around this amyloid. And that was very strange. We never saw that before in, mouse, in the mouse model itself. And so then the second thing is, do these neurons mature and become real human adult neurons? And one of the criteria is, do they have the normal splicing of tau? the other constituent, uh, the, con the major constituent of the tangles. And so you know it's very complicated, six different uh, tau isoforms in humans. In mouse you have only the four repeat tau. So we looked, we did deep sequencing of our grafts, and one of the results is here. So at the initial phase we have a lot of 3R over 4R, but at the later stage you get really a one-to-one -one relation, which is only seen in fully mature neurons, and which made us hoping that we would see tau pathology in these transplants as well as amyloid pathology. So this is just a morphological illustration of it. Um, here you see that mouse has mainly 3R and uh, 4R, and that the transplant here, the human transplant, has only very little 4R at six, at six months, but then it increases to get a one-to-one -one at eight months. It's quantification. So there is astrogliosis and microgliosis in this transplant, which is nice. Uh, and then we come to, to a couple of images which really show that this is like human Alzheimer's disease. So we have this neuritic pathology here. Uh, I think it works without words. Um, you have this presynaptic pathology here, this enormous swelling of, 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 of synaptic compartments around the plaques. You get this dendritic retraction which is also a typical hallmark of, of, of the pathology. And then this is really the, the thing which we were looking for. There is also massive neuronal cell death. So this is, a tra oh, sorry. So this is the, the, the transplant in the wild type mouse. So there is nothing happening with these transplants. And then here you have the amyloid plaques in blue, and you see here a big hole in this transplant. So there is cell death, and we quantify that. And it's not from the beginning, because in the beginning the transplants are equally 
equally well in the, in the amyloid mouse and in the control mouse, but it's over time that we get loss of neurons. And that's really something which is lacking most of the mouse models we have. And then you can look, of course, for the first time what happens with human neurons in the beginning when they are dying, um, and we get, to our surprise, a necrosis-like, and we don't know whether it's ferroptosis or ne necroptosis, we are investigating that, but we get a necrosis type of cell death in this mice model. And then we get this abnormal phosphorylation of tau, here with 88, which is not too special because you can see that in mouse too, but we got also MC1 staining here. And that's a, that's a conformational epitope, and that's something which is much more difficult. You don't see it usually in mouse uh, neurons. So it tells you that the tau is going in a bad direction. But what we, what we didn't see was tangles. So we get, in fact, a dissociation between neuronal tangle formation and cell death. And so we are really now going to explore this to see what aspect of tau biology is essential in this cascade, if at all. So we can transplant, of course, IPS cells in which tau is knocked out and see what happens and build from there on this question. So maybe an important control before I go into this is that we also used mouse IPS cells and did the same experiments and we don't see this cell that. So it's a human specific uh, aspect of the, of the model. And so then this is just to say what we can do with these mice. We can uh, take these graphs at different stages of the disease and then analyze what happens. And this is also work in progress. But this is the first time that you're really able to follow human neurons in a very early stage of disease because there is no way to take a brain sample from a patient in the preclinical phase of Alzheimer's disease. And so we can do that here. And then hopefully with additional experiments with human material, we can see to what extent we are mimicking the disease in reality. But I think this is really a much closer look than anything we have had until now. And so some of the interesting, well, these are the classical categories. We see, of course, changes in, in gene expression. But for instance, we see also upregulation of a couple of non-coding link RNAs. And uh, as you know, non-coding RNA is reasonably different between the mouse and the human, and so we think that we will find new genes and new pathways which are not present in the mouse background. So the conclusions, this model uses genotypically normal neurons, very important. Most models use hugely overexpression, also the three-dimensional culture which was recently propagated. Uh, they express normal tau ratios, something which is really important if you want to study the relation between amyloid and tau. They develop abnormal tau phosphorylation, but no tangles. Um, necrosis, not apoptosis. And I see enormous possibilities with this, and I'm very eager to expand on this, because you could do, for instance, a CRISPR, CRISPR uh, cas screen in these dying neurons and see what genes protect against that, for instance. So it's really in, in, um, unlimited what we can do with. And one of the things which I'm really very fast moving forward to is use this to use human microglia. Because the immune system between mouse and human is not very similar. And the microglia are really a focus of the research at the moment. So if we differentiate our iPS cells to microglia and we transplant them like we did with the precursors of neurons, and we deplete the brain with, the comp with certain drugs from the human microglia, there's a good chance that they will repopulate the brain with human microglia. And it doesn't need a lot of explanation what a box is open there, you can use all these different genotypes, starting, of course, with the apolipoprotein E genotype, and see how these microglia respond to amyloid pathology and how, how this goes on. So, um, and I also think, but this is really because I'm at, uh, at, 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 at this meeting here, which is brainstorming, you could also think about, like in cancer for the first time, doing these this, this models where you transplant patients, uh, patient material into the mouse and then test drugs, you could take monocytes from patients, differentiate them to microglia type, and do these experiments and see how different patients, microglia of different patients, react in different conditions to different drugs. But that's a wild idea for the future, but we are moving into that direction. Okay, and then the last point, and I think I'm quite okay with the time. So the last point I want to make is back, back to the past, back to the future, but back to the past, um, because our field has suffered from simplism and oversimplism and jumping to conclusions a lot. And um, I started my career with, with the Preston lens, and if every time I'm talking about Preston and gamma secretase, I see already people uh, looking like bored, and uh, this is a failed drug, and what are you telling me? 
I tell you, if gamma secretase would be in any other field, there would be hundreds of people working on it because it's one of the most fascinating machines uh, ever detected. But I will tell you now briefly why I think that the new technologies we have make this again a drug target because that's of course the major question in the field, do something about the disease. So, I mean, it's really, I mean, it's, a, it's not a smoking gun anymore. It's a gun which has shot, which we have in hands. 180 mutations in this gene are sufficient, missense mutations are sufficient to give you the full spectrum of Alzheimer's disease. The only thing you need is an amino acid substitution in this protein. So this is a validated drug target. It's an enzyme. And so this is the, 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 the data. If you knock out this gene, you don't form any beta anymore. And that's what the industry wanted. Let's get rid of a beta. Let's block this enzyme. So um, they started to do this without any knowledge of the basic biology of this enzyme. And here you see something which we only know since 2015. This is the cryo-AM structure of the gamma secretase. And so the president is sitting here in the, in the, in the middle of this, of this complex. And uh, I mean, it's a big difference, I think, honestly, to the companies are not always convinced, but if you know what the molecule is which you are going to target, if you have structural information, you can probably do better than what we did in our blind screens before, even not knowing that we were targeting gamma secretase, we were only targeting a beta. And so, I mean, yeah, the signaling stuff I'm going to skip, but it's a very, very crucial uh, protein in biology. That's why I'm saying if this would not be in Alzheimer's disease, there would be thousands of people working on it because it's important for cancer, for immunology, etc., etc. But leave it there. So, but this is the, 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 the paper which killed basically this field. Um, it's a nice New England Journal of Medicine paper. It's a 600 to eight, maybe 800 million, I don't know exactly, dollar experiment, a phase three trial with gamma secretase drugs, and it failed. Because of side effects, the study had to be stopped early and there was no cognitive improvement. And I'm not going to say a lot, but I simply think this is not a way we should learn from failed experiments. Um, and I will show you two things which should make you hesitating and giving me the benefit of the doubt that we should relaunch these programs. The first thing is that, yeah, there is a, it's a, it should be one paragraph in the paper that there were no significant changes in a beta during this trial in the patients, nothing. There was some effect in the blood, but a beta was not hit. And the reason was that the dose had to be lowered to a level where the side effects were minimal. So this didn't test the amyloid hypothesis. This didn't test, this didn't, this didn't test the usefulness of gamma secretase as a drug. And then the other mistake, and this is really showing the lack of basic knowledge. So gamma secretase is an essential part of the notch signaling pathway. And as you know, this is a yes or no decision. So it's not like, like phosphorylation or so where you have a dose response curve. Here it's cleaving or not cleaving. So if you want to have a side effect in the notch pathway, you block it for fully five minutes, and you have a side effect. And that's what they did. So they give one dose a day, a drug with a very short half-life. Peak, gone. Peak, gone. So the area under the curve to see how much a beta is uh, uh, lowered, because that's the integrated effect of the drug, is zero, as I told you already. But the notch effects are huge. So the test was really done to, to maximize the notch effects. And they had skin cancers. They had immunological problems. They had uh, gastrointestinal problems, which limited the dose. I think that we should have thought about this and that we should have used doses which accumulate over time and so that you would have a dose somewhere here where you have really a 50% inhibition of gamma secretase. But so I don't think that this trial was the last word in this discussion. People still think in the companies that it is, but I don't think so. And so, and I think the reason why we went the wrong path is that we didn't study further what these missense mutations were doing. So people were thinking, get rid of it, which is, not the way we do biology. Um, and so, all these mutations are missense mutations, as I said already, and they are mainly, they are only in this catalytic subunit of this gamma secretase. And so there has never been a nonsense mutation. So you need presenolin present. You need something, you need this protein present to get Alzheimer's disease. So that's really a difficult question, and people have just gone around it. And so it's only now with the crystal structure that we started to, to, to think better. And so what you see here is that, this, this is an accumulation of different cryo-EM structures, but what you see here is that this gamma secretase, first of all, all these transmembrane domains are, 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 are oblique in the membrane, so it's an instable, rather instable uh, protein. 
And you see also that it's very, very mobile in the membrane. So it's an inherent, instable protein, and that's maybe the reason why I have these three other proteins to keep it in a kind of cage, to, to keep it active. And so from there, and from there we started to think, yeah, maybe this flexibility is needed for these consecutive cleavages that gamma secretase is doing, cleaving gradually the transmembrane domain. And so for Alzheimer's disease, important is that this enzyme generates a whole series of A-beta peptides by this progressive cutting, and you can detect them. And so the longer they are, the more hydrophobic they are, the more dangerous we think. I don't want to make the same stupid uh, jumping to conclusions. We don't have much evidence. But I think because of the genetics, I think it's, it's not, not good to have long A-beta. And so then, yeah, I'm going to skip the, well, maybe not. So, so, in fact, what you have to think about it, if you shorten this peptide, you form every time new enzyme substrate complexes. And so they will have all each a different stability. And so what we did is we heated the enzymatic reaction heating with three, four, five degrees and to measure how unstable these different steps were. And so what we, we, we could show is that if you add a little bit of heat, you stop the reaction or the a beta peptide relieves, leaves the reaction at this step. And a bit more heat, it leaves at this step. And a bit more heat, it leaves at this step. And so we did similar experiments with the mutations. And the mutations basically do the same. They destabilize this catalytic core. And that's a completely different idea uh, for thinking about how Alzheimer's disease is caused. And it's in fact very important because if you measure the stability of the enzymatic complex with this heat assay, you see that the age of onset is correlated with the instability of the gamma secretase complex. So this is really the heart of the, of the genetic form of the disease. Yeah, I'm going to skip that. Well, the, the important thing is that all these FED mutations have a similar effect. And you can start now to think about sporadic effects. If you change the lipid membrane, you will probably also destabilize this enzyme. If you think about fever, heating the temperature, you might destabilize this enzyme. So all of a sudden, a lot of sporadic factors could, I don't want to jump to conclusions, needs to be investigated, but could affect this enzyme. And so what have we learned since, since the failure, this famous failure of gamma secretase? First of all, we should not inhibit the enzyme, we should stabilize the enzyme. We should find ways so that it can cut better. Second, we should not target, I didn't mention to you, but there is not one enzyme, so this inhibitor blocked all the different gamma secretases. There are at least four and probably more, all at once. Nobody in other fields thinks about blocking all the NMDA receptors or all the GABAergic receptors at once. We need specific drugs. We should be careful with the kinetics. So when you plan the, the clinical trial, please talk also with the basic scientist, and maybe they can think a bit what your clinical trial would do on the notch pathway. And then, I don't think, and that's really something which I find dreadful in our field, if you compare with, with AIDS or with cancer, people continued fighting. Even if a drug was a small blip on the radar, they just tried to find out why it didn't work and went back. So we shouldn't give up too fast. So the future, and this is just as a general conclusion, um, I'm very optimistic about, about Alzheimer's disease. And uh, the times are changing, as I, I said in the beginning of my talk, um, and I try to think a little bit how, how it would, would be in the future. And the future for Alzheimer's disease is not so difficult to imagine because we have examples of all the other diseases. Like for cardiovascular disease, we have all these items to uh, do early diagnosis. Why couldn't we do that for a neurological disease? Uh, for cancer, we have all this, this therapeutic harassment. And usually it's used in a bad way, but it's the way we progress. So I think we should be in the same level for Alzheimer's disease. And so what I'm seeing is in a couple of years, we will be able to determine the genetic risk for everybody in the, in, in, in the population to get Alzheimer's disease. And it will be a fairly good prediction. So these people will know that they have to do something to prevent it. Second, so that's what will happen. So we will know some things from lifestyle. We know cardiovascular. We have some indication that earring uh, has good Good, good ears is important, although I, I'm not so sure whether it's correlation or true. But we know a couple of factors which could improve and they, they risk your, 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 your risk on, this, uh, on disease. But then we need early diagnosis. And that's something also which I would like to have in the field. That's new tools to do early diagnosis. The, 
the cognitive tests we are doing are really taking a momentum um, uh, uh, picture of somebody's performance. And it's for everybody the same, but we know that cognition is probably the most differentiating factor between humans. Almost uh, even very clever cognitive persons use their brain in different ways. So, so one assay is not going to work. What you need is several measurements over time, at home, after your computer, to check who is at risk and who is moving into the bad direction. And there are other things. I think about sleep. We know that sleep disturbances are linked. But sleep, why don't we have holders like we have for, for, for heart disease? Why don't we have holders to measure the sleep at home and see what happens, whether there are subclinical sub, uh, epileptic insults there or whether the sleep patterns are changing? So I think that's what we will have in the future. We look in the eye to see what happens. And then finally, we will have intense treatments, and I think that anti-amyloid therapy will be part of it. Intense treatments like we do with cholesterol medication before the brain starts to decay. And then, of course, it's an aging disease, and that's also something people say, you cure Alzheimer's, you get something else. I think this is so dreadful. Yes, we will have also therapy for Parkinson, and we will have frontotemporal dementia, and so on. These are all diseases which are driven by proteins. And I talked about this SMN, hope where we have oligonucleotides blocking these proteins, they are probably generic and will maybe, hopefully, work for all these disorders. And so that's my last slide. You better treat, treat early. So most of the clinical trials have been done in late stage. This is the terminal stage of Alzheimer's disease. I don't see how you will bring that back to a normal brain. So we need to treat early in a preventive way. And so these are the acknowledgments. Uh, um, I don't think I have the time to go in detail through it. And this is uh, the DRI, which is up and start to run. Uh, it's a very ambitious project from the British government. They pushed 250 million in basic, and that's the, the pressure, 250 million pounds in basic research. And they try now to move it into other directions, but I'm standing very hard. I say, this is the core of the problem. We need to understand this disease. We need to broaden the pathways. We need to understand the drug targets. We need to understand the cellular phase. And at the moment, it keeps up. These are the people, there are six centers with a hub, with a central hub in UCL, um, where we're also building some clinical facilities, uh, for instance, to use this antisense uh, therapy. And so thank you very much for your attention. So um, we welcome any questions you may have. Uh, we have two mics uh, here, um, right, be right between the stadium seating and the tables. Hi, Dirk Keen from the University of Washington. Uh, thanks for a great talk. I'm, I have, uh, I'm, I've, I've totally bought into the idea of um, making a cellular atlas for neurodegenerative disease and Alzheimer's disease specifically. I'm wondering, to do that in humans, what patients would you do that in, and, and what regions of brain would you do it, given the enormous cost that would be involved to try to do yeah. any large part of the brain? Yeah, well... Yeah, but I, I mean, the cost is one issue, um, but the human brain project is, is an order of magnitude even bigger. Uh, so, I mean, I don't want to think too much about the cost. It's like with the human genome project. Things will become cheaper, will become faster, etc. The choice of the brain is really the discussion. And so I didn't make up my mind completely. We have done some, some, uh, some tests at the moment with DropSec uh, sequencing. We can isolate nuclei from human brain, from Alzheimer patients with reasonably good quality, RIN values above 6 and 8 even. Um, and we can do it from frozen tissue, so, so that sounds all very promising. Um, but now the next question is, of course, where do we start and what do we take? So as long as I'm on my own, we will start with the hippocampus, of course, uh, with, with the piece of the hippocampus, which we'll take from, from three patients um, and three controls and then try to get an idea about what's going on. But once we, we get a network, which I think we should start to build, uh, we will have to decide and we will have to select probably, I mean, I don't know whether it's possible, but probably there are patients which have been really very early autopsy after that. Um, and maybe even where we take biopsies, in, in, uh, biopsies not, but where we take small chunks of the brain so to minimize the delay in freezing. Um, and then what I would love to do is take Alzheimer's disease, three cases, frontotemporal dementia, three cases, and three controls as a start and see what happens. And maybe a multiple sclerosis case, because there you have very different inflammation. And so I would like to compare 
because the inflammation is an important component, inflammation over this different disorder. That would be my first thing. And then what I expect in the future is that we will have a couple of full brains uh, deep sequenced uh, and then uh, much to do what we get from the human brain atlas. So it's a lot of work, but uh, I think it's worthwhile. So uh, in one of your very early slides, you pointed out something like 60% of dementia being AD, something you didn't explicitly speak about, but you sort of hinted about it with presenilin and the knock-in, is the possibility, maybe probability, maybe clarity, that AD is more than one disease. So I wonder what your thoughts are about, you mentioned something else about learning from cancer, about sub-segregating it into molecularly identifiable and therefore approachable diseases rather than a single disease. I agree with you. Uh, the genetic makeup shows you already that there is a re really a lot of, of, of variation in, in, in the underlying genetic makeup of the disease. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't want to jump back to, to, to the past where, where, where we say, yeah, it's always amyloid and tau is always present in all these diseases. I think it's part of the symptomatology and the, and the signature of this collection of neurodegenerative disorders. But it's always the question, how far do you go down the, the, the classification? Um, um, you could even go to the level that every mutation in personalin is a different disease because apart from the effect on the beta, they have also effect on different signaling pathways. So, I mean, at the moment, I would say everything which has amyloid plaques and tangles at the same time and has this characteristic development towards dementia, I would categorize it on Alzheimer's disease, understanding that the molecular, um, how do you call it, the molecular patchwork behind it is probably a mixture of different pathways, which in one patient are more driving the inflammation, and in other patients are more driving the biochemical phase. So I would, I, I would be careful to really say it's all different. Where I agree is that all neurodegeneration, can, all dementia cannot be put on one package. And what I also agree is that many Alzheimer cases, especially in the eight more aged uh, sporadic cases, are mixed forms, where apart from an Alzheimer component with all the molecular biology behind it, you have also a vascular component, which certainly not improves the disease, and you have also in many cases alpha synuclein, which is spreading through those brains. And so then you have indeed a mixed form of dementia. Marshall Horowitz, University of Washington. I apologize if this question is naive and there may be data that bears on it, but um, I think it's really striking, as you pointed out, that the presenilins, there are no um, complete deletions or loss of uh, expression that they uh, all appear to make an intact protein. Um, so is it possible that the protein misfolds and that rather than the uh, misprocessing of A beta, it's the misfolding of the gamma secretase that somehow secondarily induces something dentrometal that leads to the misfolding of A beta? Um, yeah, well, there's many layers in your question. So um, I don't think that gamma secretase or pristinlin directly affect the folding of A beta. So it generates the substrate, the, the A beta peptide. Uh, which has an intrinsic tendency to form aggregates and then probably biochemical, biophysical conditions around this peptide drive it into aggregation in the beta sheets. So to go back to, to, to the other aspect of your question, these mutations are very mild. There are missense mutations, only one amino acid, and they produce in cell culture peptide, protein, and they integrate into this complex, in this tetrameric complex. So the misfolding of this caused by this missense mutation cannot be big. And so, so you get a complex which is still able to cleave. We showed that even with the most severe mutation, which uh, defined as the, uh, the, the earliest onset, we still find that there is some residual activity which results in release of a beta peptides under the long forms. So they are not incomplete digested a beta peptides, to, to put it simple. So I think that's a common theme there. So what I do not exclude is that these enzymes, which are not so, act so optimal active anymore, that they also have effects on other signaling pathways in which person is involved, but it will not be major. We did experiments in FED brain, where we took, where by definition, well, by def in most cases you have, well, in almost all cases, you have a wild type allele and a diseased allele. And so we checked the effect on processing of NOTCH and of APP, and we found that the intracellular, the signaling part, is compensated almost entirely by the wild type allele. 
But what's not compensated is the incomplete digestions of the beta peptides because they are released. So I think there is a common denominator there. Thank you for the great talk. Um, the, um, the journey you took us through with uh, um, gamma secretase inhibitors um, made me start thinking about these various mutations and how we can differentially categorize them and think about these diseases. So initially we had the autosomal dominant APP, MAPT mutations, and those were clearly alpha-synuclein, they're gain of functions, right? But now we have all these other mutations, including presenilin um, and, and various other mutations in, um, in well, PSP. In APOE, yeah. for instance. Yeah. Sorry? APOE mutation exactly, or the TREM2 exactly. mutation. So it makes me wonder, since these are more likely loss of function or change of functions in cellular pathways, especially in protein degradation pathways, if that then, it really changes our entire outlook on the disease, where these are not necessarily diseases where we should just be knocking down presenilin, for example. It was just a mistake, as you pointed out. And, and how does that impact how we think about knocking down amyloid and knocking down tau in these aging diseases? Well, I mean, these are all questions which we need to investigate with a little bit less simplism as we did in the past. Uh, and we have the models now also to do that. Uh, I think it could be very reasonable to lower APP because, for, for, but it's a simplistic reasoning, because you have, uh, 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 of course, the, the, the type of A-beta drives the reaction. Longer A-beta will give you more aggregated A-beta, but also the concentration, like, like any reaction. So, so, but we need to think carefully there and what you do to function, normal function, etc. Um, the second part is the heterogeneity of the genetic um, contribution to the disease. I think the micro, that's why I, I talk a little bit more about the micro. The micro gear gives us a first smell of what, we, what is going to happen. So we will try to sort out now whether this subtype, this subfamily of microglia with this expression profile, which is either driven by APOE or I don't know whether it's cause or consequence there and what APOE is exactly doing, but it's certainly a characteristic of this microglia. So we can screen for drugs. We can do phenotypical screens basically here, trying to shift the expression pattern of this microglia back to the homeotypic version, doing our, our experiments in vivo, see whether that's protective or not. If it's protective, it's good. If it's making them more aggressive, so getting more of this APOE expressing microglia is uh, protective, then we will do that. So that's the type of new drugs which we will develop in the future. I was wondering um, what you think about the new base inhibitors, particularly, let's say, the Merck, uh, the Rubicostat, which, you know, knocks a, a amyloid beta down about 95 percent. Uh, what did you say, 5 percent? 95 percent, the new yeah, base Yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic inhibitors. drug. Uh, to inhibit base. The question is whether it's the cure or not. So I, I'm worried about uh, uh, the base inhibitors. For base, there is very little genetic support if you compare it with gamma secretase. Well, there's the, you know, the Icelandic yes. uh, mutation. It, it pre it's a pretty good mimic of that mutation. Mm, in terms the of Icelandic mutation is a mutation in APP. Right, and right. It affects but, but it's base at the processing. site of base cleavage, right? It affects, but it affects also the aggregation of the peptide and uh, it's, I, I mean, yeah, okay, well, we can discuss this maybe later. Uh, I, I think that evident, there, there, I think we can agree there are two, the Swedish mutation and then the Icelandic mutation, and then it's done. Uh, the evidence that base is real, there is no mutation in base. There is no genetic risk with base expression mm -hmm. in this profile I've shown to you. So that validation is lacking in my opinion. So it's all based on the idea that lowering a beta is the only thing you have to do to cure Alzheimer's disease. While even with the Presnelin mutations, it's not, it's the length of the A-beta peptide which drives the disease. And so with base inhibitors, you will lower all the A-beta peptides, and that's done. The good news, I thought that there would be a lot of side effects with these base inhibitors because there are 20 other substrates. That's the good news is that this seems not to be the case after two years or three years in humans, so that's a good thing. The only part, the part of the iceberg which is under the water is that this base changes the cleavage pattern of the amyloid precursor protein, and you get... Uh, P3 peptides, and you get these zeta peptides, and that's again peptides where we don't know what they are doing. And so we'll increase those in these patients, and we'll of course not see immediate side effects. So that's for me the big question. What's going on there? Last question. Uh, Martin Kampmann, UCSF. Uh, yeah, fantastic talk. I was uh, particularly excited about your uh, human neuronal transplant model into mice, and I think it really highlights the non-cell autonomous uh, nature of the disease. I am interested, though, also in terms of the genes that uh, you might have looked at on the neuronal level itself. You mentioned you use EPOE3, EPOE4. Was that actually important to, uh, to cause the disease? Because uh, Yeah, well, we thought it was a good, good start to, to get it, but we are now uh, transplanting EPOE. 
E knockouts and E3, we have patient lines with homozygous E3, E4, corrected with CRISPR because you need to be careful with the genetic background of your iPS cells. Uh, so it's a lot of work which is go ongoing and we are also doing now transplants with neurons, but also with astroglia and as I mentioned with microglia. So it's really trying to, to make sense of the cellular phase of Alzheimer's disease and see how different. But I mean, I, I want to publish a couple of papers quickly to show that it works and then I hope really that other people are going to take it over because it's, uh, I, I are going to work on it also because uh, uh, the question, uh, it's unlimited and, and it's very expensive. Actually. Yeah, uh, it, it's a fantastic model and uh, one thing we are very interested in is, is genetic modifier screens using uh, CRISPR so I, I, I really think your suggestion to use that in that model is very exciting, so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Barry.